going to give you a brief overview today of some of the um, issues and challenges we have looked at at the IEA in our energy technology and policy analysis, as well as across some of the broader work that we do um, in our World Energy Outlook and our Energy Efficiency Divisions, um, and how this has implications particularly in steps forward and some of the opportunities we have around energy efficiency. Just to get started, let me come back here a second. A picture of some of the work that we do with the IEA and the challenge that lays ahead of us. Um, this is a look at this century's emissions from the energy sector. Um, we, of course, can go back further into the 1990s, 1970s, even all the way to the Industrial Revolution in the beginning of the 20th century. And the key message here is that as our economies have grown, so have CO2 emissions from the energy sector. Um, this is pretty much universally true, and um, the only cases where we really have seen a change in emissions have been, for better or worse, the financial recessions we've seen in the past, um, like we did in 2008. And then something positive happened in the last uh, five years, where after 2010, particularly because of some of the measures that were taken after the financial recession in 2008, we saw, in fact, that emissions flatlined. So this was really good news for the global economy that we were seeing economic trends start to bounce back upward and emissions were staying stable. Of course, we want to see them go down, but the positive news is that we had stabilized them. And this was because of a lot of efforts to deploy clean energy technologies and energy efficient solutions. Um, for example, we have now sold in more than 3 million electric cars. Um, LED lighting, which was practically inexistent in market five years ago, now represents more than 35% of global sales. Um, solar prices came down by more than 70% in the last five years. So a lot of good progress there. But unfortunately today, as was announced by our executive director, Dr. Fatih Biral, at the Clean Energy Ministerial a few weeks back, the bad news we have to report to you is that in 2017, emissions went back up. Um, in fact, the highest they've ever been. And part of this is because the rollout and deployment of the technologies and solutions we need have started to slow down in many markets. Um, if we want to flip that glass is half empty perspective, we could equally say that this means that we now have a lot of opportunity in front of us. If we speed up the deployment of those solutions, in fact, we can once again keep emissions stable and we hope bring emissions down. Now, if we were to continue on this less efficient pathway, um, which we define as our central scenario at the IEA, we know that emissions with the economy will continue to grow. And this, of course, is not at all in line with our sustainable development objectives or with the Paris Agreement signed in 2015. And realistically, where we want to be is what we call our sustainable development scenario, which is a major, major shift away from what we have done in the past. The positive news here is that we can do this using solutions that we know of already today. And energy efficiency is at the heart of those solutions. It's the reason we call energy efficiency the first fuel. It's something that all of us can do across all sectors, industry, power, transport, buildings. It's something we can do at home. It's something we can do in our cities. And it will, with renewables, help to deliver the sustainable development scenario. The piece around this that's perhaps most important is thinking as to how we sell energy efficiency. Um, many people don't understand, because we don't see it, CO2 emissions. We don't understand the reasons or the implications around the climate agreement signed in Paris. But we do get issues like this. Now, I know with the lighting this is a little difficult to see, but this is a hazy city. You can see the buildings over here in the corner. How many of you have ever seen something similar to this in your cities on a day where it's hot and humid and the smog is getting pushed down? Okay, so a few of you. Guesses as to where this might be? Beijing, New Delhi, London in 1952? <laughs> okay. This actually is Paris a few years ago. And if I step back, you can see the Eiffel Tower here behind me. And I wanted to show you this example for two reasons. The first is that energy and emissions and the implications of those emissions from energy affect all of us. Um, and 
pollutants from local air um, pollutant, pollution in cities is not just something that happens in developing countries. It also happens at home in places like Paris. Um, it doesn't look like this. I live in Paris. It doesn't look like this every day, but it does look like this on some days, and air pollution still continues to be a big problem. And it actually is one of the key drivers of pre-mortality in populations across the world. So nearly six and a half million people die from air pollution related deaths every single year. And we know that as air pollution continues to plague our cities, this will be an increasingly important implication for our sustainable development goals. Now, the next piece is also that we want energy to be accessible and affordable. Um, now, this is a picture here of Africa, but before I come to this, I'd just like to point out that, again, this is not something that is just about developing countries. One example is here in Europe, where we already have 50 million households every winter that struggle to pay their utility bills. In other words, the energy is too expensive for them to heat their homes appropriately. And then, of course, when we step to places like South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, energy access is a major issue. There are still 1.1 billion people in the world that do not have reliable access to electricity. And our current policy scenarios in our World Energy Outlook shows that even with positive development in this area, we still could see 600 million people in Sub-Saharan Africa in 2030 without electricity. In other words, three out of five people in that region could still be without reliable electricity in 2030. But if we were to push a little bit harder, we actually could help change this situation. Going from what we see here, this is a NASA satellite image from 2017, to this. This has major implications on things like air pollution, so using electricity for lighting, for example, instead of using dirty kerosene lamps. It also means that these people will have access to communication technologies, to be connected to the outside world, to improve their education, to improve their productivity and their economic output. But it means we have to push a little harder. And another example around this is why we all are impacted by these types of issues. And again, it's not something just in developing countries, but the world is changing. For better or worse, we're seeing things like greater storm surges, hotter weather in the summer, extreme cold sometimes in some places in the winter, and it's happening everywhere. Just to give you an example, if we look, hopefully here, this was a month ago. Some of the hottest temperatures ever recorded in a city. It was more than 50 degrees Celsius in Pakistan in late April of this year. Two years ago, in India, record-breaking temperatures of 52 degrees Celsius. And in China last summer, which actually is happening as we speak this summer in Beijing, they started talking about a heat wave in June. They were still talking about it in July. And there were many cities in China where it was above 35 degrees Celsius every single day for that month. Even here in Europe, Typically, cool places like France had a record number of hot days last summer. And already this year, in April, normally when it's raining and chilly in Paris, we had 35-degree weather. The implications of this are, of course, that our demand for energy services are changing as the world changes. And this, of course, means that we can expect, as the world gets hotter, even in a sustainable development scenario, that things like air conditioning are going to grow. And of course, that has implications depending on how we use those cooling services on energy and the environment. If we look at the world today, we know already that many places we didn't think needed air conditioning are now asking for them. We know, of course, in some of these red places that air conditioning is a critical piece of economic development. If we look, for example, at Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew, who was considered the modern father of Singapore, made it a policy priority to put air conditioning into businesses and public buildings and schools because it increased productivity. And he was once quoted as saying that Singapore would not be the economic powerhouse it is today if they didn't have those cooling services because it allows people to be comfortable, healthy, and productive. But if we were to look at this map, and cut out those cooler places, 
we'd see something like this. Three billion people live in these hot places where it is hotter than 25 degrees Celsius every single day of the year. And yet, only 8% of them today own an air conditioner, compared to 92% in the United States and 91% in Japan, even compared to China, which is nearly two-thirds of households today that now own an air conditioner, compared to just 1% 25 years ago. So as we look forward, places like India and Sub-Saharan Africa, Brazil, Mexico, places where it is hot, as people get richer, we know they will ask for more energy services for air conditioning. The reason I mention this is that it comes back to the story of energy efficiency. Cooling and energy services are a good thing. They help us to be productive, they help us to be happy and healthy, to feel good, to get things done, but how efficiently we do it is incredibly important. And if we look at the cooling story from this report that the IEA just released on the future of cooling a few weeks ago, what we can see is that across all of the major markets, the availability of very efficient equipment, which you see here in blue, is pretty much universally true. But what people are actually buying, what you see here as the yellow line, is nowhere near what is available in markets. And in many cases, it's nowhere near what is better technology at the same price. Which begs the question of, why are people not buying energy efficiency? If we have products that are two to three times more efficient, why is everyone buying down here on the bottom? So as part of this energy efficiency story, we started looking at the implications around how to drive energy efficiency. And again, looking at cooling, more than 55 countries today already have in place energy performance standards for air conditioners. So if they have these performance standards in place, the first logical response, of course, is maybe we need policies to be more stringent. If we want to drive the purchase of those more efficient air conditioners up, maybe we need to update these policies. But the second, especially within the broader question of energy efficiency, is how do we make people actually want to invest in energy efficiency investments? And this comes back to an old English expression, I'm not sure how many of you will know it, but you can lead a horse to water, but it doesn't mean the horse will drink that water. And one of the challenges that we see today is how to sell energy efficiency. Because by and large, energy efficiency is something that's invisible. It delivers services to us, but we don't necessarily see them. And some of the things that consumers are looking at, like brand recognition, product size, product color, certainly product cost, have nothing to do with the water we're offering them. So as we think about what we can do to deliver the promise of energy efficiency, we need to think about different ways to sell it. And again, looking at cooling, one example here is how energy efficiency can help us to provide energy services in a much better way. So one example is looking at the power system. Now, we expect over the next 30 years to add 4 billion air conditioners to the planet. Okay? That means we sell 10 air conditioners every single second for the next 30 years. And if we buy those inefficient air conditioners, we will see in many, many markets that the demand on the power sector is going to increase significantly especially when people come home in the evening and turn on those ACs. And this means that we could see, on an annual average, peak power demand as much as 45% in some countries coming just from air conditioners alone. Already today, we have seen examples where it's much higher than that. Just a few years ago, for example, in Philadelphia in the United States, on a very hot day, nearly 75% of the total peak electricity demand was from air conditioners in buildings. In Saudi Arabia today, during the hot months, 55% of total electricity goes to air conditioning. And this, of course, has major implications on things like pollution, how we meet power demand, how we build power capacity, how we transmit power capacity, how we pay for power, and all of this, in the end, comes back to the consumer. So looking at some of this and how can we sell the message, we can consider, for example, the role that energy efficiency 
would have on things that people can tangentially feel, like local air pollution. Coming back to the example of the smog that we often see in cities, when those peak power plants, very often coal and gas, come on to meet power demand. Now, in our central scenario from our world energy outlook, we expect that without efficiency, the pollutants for things like SOx and NOx and particulate matter could increase by as much as 40%. And even through the current pledged energy efficiency measures, we still wouldn't change very much. They would essentially be just under what we see today. Don't forget, it's still six and a half million people who die prematurely because of this air pollution in cities. But in our sustainable development scenario, we actually have found that we could cut these by more than 70% through energy efficiency measures. In particular, particulate matter could be cut by more than 80% as we move people to more efficient end uses, particularly, again, in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, by moving them off of very polluting, very inefficient traditional use of biomass to modern and more efficient technologies. Another example of what energy efficiency can deliver is looking at pricing. So we all care about what goes into our wallet and what comes out of our wallet. And if we look again at the example of cooling, we know that as we ask for more and more electricity, okay, in our reference scenario here, someone has to build that and somebody has to pay for it. And in fact, the electricity demand using inefficient air conditioners in our reference scenario is equivalent to all of the electricity production capacity of the United States, the European Union, and Japan today, just for air conditioning. If we do that, the prices of electricity will go up. Someone has to build and maintain that electricity capacity, particularly for peak electricity demand. But if we pursue it using efficient air conditioning technologies that you see here in the light blue for our efficient cooling scenario, we could cut those investments for power generation needs by more than $1.2 trillion over the next 30 years, which means that on average across the world, the electricity cost for meeting air conditioning demand could be cut in half. When we put these together, it's what we refer to as endearingly as our flower power of energy efficiency. Some of you may have seen this before, but effectively, we're talking about the multiple benefits around energy efficiency, of which I've shown you a few examples. It's in things like improved health, less money coming out of our wallets to pay for energy services, improved comfort, better access to energy services, and all of these, of course, help us to deliver on our multiple policy objectives around sustainable development goals. And as we look at this, the reason we say that energy efficiency is at the heart of our sustainable development ambitions is because it allows us to do the same with less. And as we move forward, the more efficiency we use, we can do more with the same. And of course, the more efficiency we deploy, then we can do more with more. And as the world will add another 2 billion people, if we want to meet our climate ambitions, if we want to meet our sustainable development goals, we need to be better at how we deliver energy services, which means that energy efficiency becomes the tool that allows us to raise the standards of living for everyone across the world and to do it efficiently, which is why we call energy efficiency, this beautiful figure you see before you, as the tool to prosperity for people across the world. So, Coming back to this question of how does this relate to cities, energy efficiency can deliver better services with less impact on the environment for all of us. It can help to lower cost, it can help to improve our daily lives, but it comes down to action. We have to convince people to act if we want to ensure that we actually obtain the necessary energy efficiency investments to achieve our sustainable development goals. And with that, we have to do a better job of convincing people on a day-to-day -day basis of why they should care about energy efficiency, why should they should turn the lights off when they leave the room, why they should buy more efficient products. Some of this is very challenging, but I think as an urban planner, this comes back to the role that cities can play 
in taking these very broad ambitions and boiling them down into something that is meaningful for people, convincing them that in their day-to-day -day lives, energy efficiency can deliver for them. And that means creating innovative solutions, better business programs, better business practices, better policy frameworks at a local scale to improve the lives of everyone through energy efficiency. So with that, I'll leave you with my little white guy here thinking about improving our energy services. Let's think outside of the box and let's deliver more efficient solutions to improve everyone's lives and achieve our sustainable development goals. Thank you very much.